All right, we're um, at the TFC Zoom podcast number 14, and this is the legendary Boo Shexnader. Um, Boo called me twice today about um, the link for this Zoom podcast, and I didn't pick it up either time. So I texted him and said, who is this? And he just answered back in three letters, boo. And I was kind of like, this is, this is very surreal for me because you've always been a hero. <laughs> and I, I've always loved listening to you speak. And uh, I will never forget tw 12 years ago, no, it was eight years ago, I sent you an email about a kid that had an injured hamstring. And I, I sent you about a paragraph and you sent me back about 10 paragraphs and <laughs> I'll never forget your generosity. And I've heard that from so many other people that um, it's been just such a great example for people like Chris and I to continue to be giving with our knowledge and all that. Well, I thank you. Um, I was very lucky when I was a young coach to have good mentors who were patient with me. And I, I kind of take that responsibility seriously. So I appreciate the compliment. Who, who were your mentors? My primary mentor was Dan Path. You know, uh, when I came to Louisiana, uh, I mean, while I was in Louisiana, uh, coaching high school, not totally unlike you, but anyway, I was coaching football and track and field and uh, doing a pretty decent job of both. But it took me a whole weekend to figure out my game plan for football. And it took me about 10 minutes to figure out my daily plan for my track practice. And I realized I needed to learn more about this. And uh, Dan had just come to LSU, I guess, in like 82. So I guess it was around 83, 84 that, you know, I started hustling up and driving up there to watch practices. And Dan kind of took me under his wing, was very patient with me. And he was the person that served an important role in my life. He, he basically, he was two things for me. He was a tremendous mentor. But more importantly, I kind of entered a phase in my coaching where I was starting to see things a little differently than some other people did. And uh, Dan was the person who said, no, 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 trust your instincts, trust your eye, you know, and don't be afraid to forge forward, even though you're kind of away from the, the mainstream, so to speak. And so those were two things that he did a lot for me. And he did a lot for me. And uh, I'm still very appreciative of that. I remember one time it was at the uh, Illinois Track Coaches Association Clinic, I believe is in a cafeteria. And and you opened your park days. Was that the Oak Park days? Oh, for sure. It was the Oak Park days. Yeah. And I will never forget, you opened your uh, your talk with, with an appeal to all the coaches to suspend or forget everything they've ever been taught before. <laughs> and I'll never forget that because, because sometimes you almost have to tell people to do that for them to open their minds. Yeah, you know, there, there'll always be a flat earth society, unfortunately, you know, and, that, and that's unfortunate, but... You know, and uh, but I always tell coaches, you know, understand the bell curve. You know, the majority of the people you're going to listen to are not going to be special. You know, the majority of the people you listen with to are going to be mainstream. And and uh, so don't be afraid. If you understand the science and it makes sense to you, and there's then there's a reason to try it, even though you might. And I always do say that the the good coaches are always 30, 40 years ahead of the research. You know, and, you know, as much as I enjoy reading research and, and, and appreciate research, most of the time when I look at research, I'm not looking for ways to tweak my program. I'm looking at research for affirmation and, you know, things that I've been doing for a while quite often that I find very successful. Suddenly you find something in the research that, oh, I was right. That's why that works. Or, oh, well, it works as I knew it did, but it works for a different reason. And to me, that's the thing. I, I just think that you can help a lot of kids while you're, you know, while you're waiting for P to be great point, bigger than 0.05 or whatever the hell the, the, the gold standard is in research, uh, you know, um, confirmations and such there. So, so in any case, I, you know, I just think that you have to have that pioneer spirit in order to be really good at this stuff. One of the things, go uh, ahead, Tony. Um, just clearing up my, my, uh, we said we weren't going to talk about weights, but we'll talk a little bit about it. The, um, one, that, one, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to clear up was I'm not anti weight room, but I have witnessed so much bad weight room in my life, uh, that interfered with the things I was trying to do, um, on the track that, that sometimes I get that, 
that reputation for being anti weight room. But I just wanted to say that I'm anti bad weight room and you could be my strength coach anytime. Tony, I know you're not anti weight room. Uh, you know, I, I know exactly what you, because the guy, when, for my, the first two years of my career, I was the guy you hated, you know, to be, to be very frank with you. So I understand exactly where you're from, but I just thought it would kind of pique interest if I kind of poked a little fun at you and whatever. And I, I totally understand you're not anti-weight room, but I didn't think that that would make a good topic because of that, you know, and, and uh, be, because of the fact that it's so misdone so often, you know, there are so many kids who really never achieve peak performance just because the weight room isn't done correctly. There are a lot of coaches out there who write speed training beautifully, but the speed, speed training really doesn't take root because of the fact that the weight room is producing interference. So I just thought it would be a, a good topic. What are, what's the major, you know, like may, maybe what were you doing bad in the weight room in your first couple of years? Or what are pe the biggest mistakes that you see people making these days? Well, keep in mind, I um, began in football. You know, I got into elite level track pretty much by accident. You know, I was pretty happy being a defensive coordinator and a high school track coach and winning championships at that level. And then along came a bad principal. And the next thing you know, I'm coaching college track. Uh, so, so, but, but basically, you know, I came up in football. So I was around football coaches. So I had a mentality, which was you know, pretty standard at the time where, you know, squatting was important and it was important to squat all the time. And ultimately the level of the accomplishment that you found in squat and bench press was important and those types of things. And eventually I just started to open my eyes and realize that, wait, 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 this, I see value here, but at the same time, I also see harm and started to understand and start to try to find ways to balance things out. I started to understand that there are multiple different forms of strength that need to be developed. I started to understand that the balance between these different forms of strength was very important and important for movement quality. And that in many situations, um, that type, those slow forms of strength were just being overdone. And also noticed that very seldom did they seem to be the limiting factor in performance. You know, there are a lot of people who played well without it. So obviously this is not the limiting factor. So just keeping my eyes open uh, kind of helped me to kind of overcome the biases that I received early in my, that I had from, you know, early experiences in my career. And then I just kind of went on a mission to just try to figure all this stuff out, I guess. Did I answer your question completely? Yes. And just one follow-up before I hand it over to Chris. One of the things I hear from the strength and conditioning world is that their number one job is the safety of their athletes. Mm -hmm. And they believe wholeheartedly that, that the weight room creates durability with athletes. Mm -hmm. But in your presentation, you talked about if you are not wise and you overdo static lifts, that athletes can actually get hurt because of the things they're doing in the weight room. Yeah, well, there are three things that, that injure athletes. Uh, lack of preparation, uh, overdoing it or improper preparation, you know? So ultimately, if you uh, are preparing athletes in ways that aren't really specific to what they're doing, then ultimately you haven't really prepared them for anything except what you're doing with them. So, you know, it's just amazing to me how every single year watching football closely and still being kind of involved, how many athletes come directly out of training camp, um, you know, their so-called uh, preseason workouts and go to a training camp and immediately end up injured. And that just tells you there's some dichotomy, some kind of conflict be between the way they're preparing and what they're actually forced to do there. You know, I think one of the things I said in the, uh, in the, in the talk I gave was, you know, I, so many times, you know, you, yeah, I, I've heard it a thousand times, you know, this kid lifts weights all the time and then suddenly they try to sprint. And after they try to sprint, they're sore as hell. And then the coach gives some flippant kind of generic, well, it's different muscles. No, it's not different muscles. You only have one set of muscles, you know. Ultimately, what that's telling you is that the levels of tension that you receive in a sprint environment are higher than the levels that you receive in the, in the, the weightlifting environment. So, you know, I just believe that all of our life we've been drilled to think you try to get stronger to be faster, but it also works the other way around. I guess it, 
different muscles is kind of like that old wives tell that certain people had more muscles or an extra muscle or stuff like that. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. Well, I've heard it hundreds of times. You know, it's different muscles. Well, well, you only got one set. So, so I'm interested in, in watershed moments in your career where you were down one path and then you came across something that changed your direction of what you're doing or changed how you create work workouts. Well, uh, what are some? Pardon? One, one moment was I remember I was coaching high school track and I had a long jumper who could jump about 23.6 or 23.8, and which is, you know, pretty solid. And, That's pretty uh, good. And I, I wanted to make sure I did the right thing with this young man. So I called up a bunch of college coaches and they told me a bunch of things and I quickly coached him down to about 22.4. And <laughs> that's when I realized that everybody who's coaching in college is not necessarily smarter than me. And, you know, and then that's when I kind of started one. Of course, the second watershed moment was when, uh, was when I uh, met Dan and Dan took me kind of under his wing, so to speak, real early in my career in the, in the early to mid eighties. And then since that point, I've had hundreds of watershed uh, moments because every failure has been a watershed moment. You know, I, I, I firmly believe in coaching that about coaching, the nature of coaching is that coaching is a problem solving profession. That's ultimately about, is about what it is. And I just uh, think that, you know, problems to coaches are like spinach to Popeye. Every time that you basically solve a problem, you become more powerful and your problem solving skills effectively uh, uh, become better. And uh, that's why I always tell young coaches to kind of understand that your problems are your greatest asset and they're, they're your greatest opportunity for, um, for, for improvement. And whenever I give a talk, you know, one of the things I like to preface with is that a lot of the stuff that I'm going to tell you here today doesn't come because of the Olympians I had. It comes because of the failures that I had. When did you make the shift to Olympic lifts? Because I, your programs pretty heavy Olympic lifts. Have you always been an Olympic lift guy? Because when you came in or you started, Olympic lifts hadn't taken over yet. They were still pretty much the I Nebraska kinda, Husker Power program. <laughs> it was probably maybe my third or fourth year of coaching high school, I think. Keep in mind that I, as a high school athlete, um, we actually did lift, which was kind of unusual in the late seventies, you know, where, when I was a high school athlete, our coach actually took some train wheels and welded them onto a piece of pipe. And we did some squat looking things and things like that. So weightlifting was kind of just coming in vogue in high schools at that time. And then when I, you know, got onto college, I wasn't much of a college athlete. I only played as a walk on for about a year. And long story behind that. But anyhow, I start, that's the first time I ever saw like real weight equipment. And then one of the guys named Barrett Murphy, who was on our college staff, kind of was versed in Olympic lifts. And that was the first time when we started to kind of, I kind of knew what a clean was. I, you know, this is like, I'm in my college years, I'm already coaching part time. And then uh, I just started realizing that all of these programs started, were doing this type of stuff, the programs I kind of respected. And so I would say it's probably about four or five years into my um into my uh, coaching career where I kind of started dabbling into them. And by the time I hit maybe the seventh or eighth year, they were a big part of what I was doing with everybody I worked with. And of course, they're the cornerstone of my weight room program now. And what was your learning curve? Because back then, there was not a lot of material out there about Olympic lifts. Um, how, what was your learning curve in bringing that to your high school athletes? What were some of the things that you did that made that program much more effective as far as not hurting the athlete when you're doing the lift compared to- Well, I've learned one thing at early age is that um, if, if you're just a little careful and a little conservative, you can get away with some mistakes, you know? And I think at that stage of my career, I kind of realized I didn't do anything. So I tended to keep things on the safe side. I tended to err on the side of fast as opposed to the side of heavy. And I think God maybe blessed me with just a little bit of common sense about knowing when something looks really bad, it's probably a bad idea. So I kind of just operated on harsh sense there for a while. And I don't know that I didn't become a really good technical teacher in the Olympic list until many years later, to be frank with you. And now there are some coaches who tell me I shouldn't be doing Olympic list because my kids don't rack exactly properly or whatever, you know, with track and field. I'm always dealing with long arm kids who struggle in some situations. But, you know, at some point in time, I started to understand that, you know, trust your instincts and understand that 
um, when you're dealing with Olympic lifts for the purposes of coaching athletes who are not weightlifters, that there are some things that you can do safely, even though they might not be perfect. You know, so when I have a kid who, because they have long arms, racks the bar with the elbows a little lower than perfect, I don't sweat it too much. I just might not let them put on those extra five pounds. So I just try to keep a common sense approach to it and just make sure that, you know, you go into the weight room every day, kind of knowing how, uh, what perceived level of exertion you want. And ultimately you just make sure you get it, whatever it looks like, you know. I was going to ask you um, just the level of the amount of money that's in college football. I mean, a big 10 school that just hired a, a new coach for $4.4 million a year, six year contract. And, you know, their strength and conditioning coach makes hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, over the summer uh, posted a, a, a tweet going through speed ladders and boasting of having double figures on the team, over 10 guys who can bench press 405 and mm -hmm. over 35 guys with a 300 pound or better power clean. Mm -hmm. And when is the speed game of college football going to realize that S and C people have got to evolve into speed based coaches? Well, if Alabama hasn't proved that this year, um, then shame on us because nobody has really paid much attention to the big change at Alabama. You know, um, you know, I was fortunate to be at LSU with Coach Saban, not, not claiming to know him well. We've had a couple of conversations, but, uh, but you know, he I felt like he had a bit of a problem. I think his problem was probably centered a little more about non-contact season-ending injuries than it was actual speed. You know, and they kind of brought, and not to throw anybody under the bus, but obviously the philosoph philosophical change they've made in their program has made a big difference. And I always kind of wondered the same thing myself, to be frankly with you. But, but to be honest with you, Tony, every profession is inbred to some extent. You know, uh, track coaches talk to track coaches. Football coaches talk to football coaches. Strength coaches tend to talk to the people who have similar positions. And that's why I always uh, tried to look outside of my own realm when I had particular problems. You know, like when I was coaching javelin, if I couldn't figure out, I'd look at a quarterback, you know. If I was coaching long jump and couldn't figure it out, I'd look at Jordan going up for a dunk. You know, so those are things that I always try to, to, to look at and not to look at myself as living on an island, but living in a world where athletic movement uh, transverses lots of different sports and lots of different activities and such. So to answer your question, that's unfortunate that people are still tweeting and bragging about that type of stuff. And again, like I said, you know, there's always going to be a flattered society, uh, but Ultimately, all we can do is clean up our particular corners of the world. And thank God we have people like you who are out here trying to, you know, salvage and, and, and save people, you know, and, and let people know that there is another view. There is a more viable, more effective philosophy that can keep your athletes injury free. You know, I, I make this statement sometimes in talks and it's a controversial one, but I am totally convinced that 75% of NCAA athletes in that sport do not achieve their genetic potential speed-wise. And of those that do, the, the few, it typically takes them two to three years longer than it probably should just because of poor training design. And again, that's not painting a wide brush, you know, that's, you know, but, but culturally, you know, that culture does still exist. And, you know, I've been fighting to exterminate it just like you have, but unfortunately, you know, sometimes we just see. I love your answer because it almost uh, is a plug for to have something like a track football consortium where we're bringing the two worlds together. And we never meant for our target audience to be the S and C world, but mm -hmm. they may be the biggest group that sign up for something like this. So they're mm -hmm. able to come and and hear people from their own camp, but also from other camps and and they feel uncomfortable, and they look into it more, and, and so I, I think that's a, a real positive thing. Yeah, one other thing that's unfortunate is that the, um, the way NCAA election exists is that the strength and conditioning coaches have so much contact with the athletes that they have basically become the structure providers and the disciplinarians and those types of things as well. So I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, people getting jobs who aren't necessarily the soundest in their programming, but might 
actually be really good at athlete relationships and developing structure and those types of things, which is, of course, is extremely important in a football program when you're trying to keep 85 people or whatever kind of in line and on the same page. That That is a big deal. I get that. You know, I did football a long time. I understand that the necessity for that type of culture. So maybe in some cases, training uh, design uh, qualifications might not be valued quite as much as some of those other qualifications. So I loved your comment in your presentation about shiny things. I think, oh. <laughs> especially in this day and age with whether it's YouTube, Instagram, a lot of people fall for the shiny things. So I wanted to know, what are some shiny things that you bid on that work? What are some shiny things that way overrated and don't, shouldn't work? <laughs> well, you've already mentioned the speed ladders. I think they make good firewood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, I continually get very gimmicky types of things. You know, I, I always, you, you know, you know I, I probably get in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 emails a week from coaches who want advice and want to run things past me or whatever. And so often they're with very, very young athletes and they're doing extremely complicated forms of work. Some of the weight room workouts resemble obstacle courses. You know, uh, the work consists of complexes that don't give athletes enough experience at any one thing to actually produce anything. And it just seems to be a problem in general is the interpretation of what high level elite athletes do and bringing that down to the level of high school aged athletes. And I'm of the opinion, frankly, that until you're like 24 years old, you know, you don't really need to specialize, period. You pretty much need to be in a kind of generic speed slash power slash strength development program to be very honest with you. And I just think that the over-specialization thing is just driving everybody crazy. Uh, and as far as what shiny things, I, I've always kind of been averse to shiny things. So maybe that's why I am where I hear where I am here today is that I haven't really bid on a lot of those things. You know, I, I got rid of my computer that ran Windows 7 long after Windows 10 was out because I never trust the new thing right away. I'm always waiting for that second version or waiting for them to kind of fix it and figure out the bugs, you know, because I know what I have works. And I've kind of been the same way in my coaching career, frankly. Uh, and I've never really felt like a behind uh, as a result of it, you know. So, so that being said, I always look at those things with interest. And every once in a while, I find something that I can see that, oh, that makes a little bit of sense here, like maybe assisted jumping or maybe the flywheel deal or whatever in certain situations, how that could actually be something that would work. But then people tend to overuse these things and build entire programs around them and such, and then the whole wheels just fall off. You know, for the coaches association, I coach a strength and I teach a strength and conditioning class, and it, and it, you know, basically it's in the track coaches um, uh, organization, and basically it's a it's a strength and conditioning class that kind of follows some of the philosophical things that I've kind of talked about here in my talk, and it offers a certification. But we cover weightlifting, we cover body weight training, we cover med ball training, we cover these things. And I always get criticized, you know, well, why didn't you cover bands? Why didn't you cover this? Why didn't you cover that? And I got a simple answer. Well, in two years, that'll all be gone and there'll be a whole new set of things that you're asking me why I didn't include them. And ultimately, I just like to personally stick around with the things that have kind of stood the test of time. And then if I can find something that helps a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll kind of It'll be all icing on the cake, but it'll never be the cake. The, uh, one of the things you said in your presentation when you're talking about volume, and that's probably one of my main things that I talk about, especially when I'm talking to football coaches who I would think a, an alarming percentage of football players more is always, or football coaches, more is always better. I mean, if they could, they would practice six hours a day, I think. Uh, and I think you were talking about volume in the weight room, but that volume, I've always said in football practice, if you practice too long with lots of conditioning at the end, you'll have two types of players. Players that take it easy early so that they can survive late, or players that come out and give you high efforts and they're fatigued late. And you said a very similar thing about the weight room. You said they either cruise early or fatigue late. 
So it, that is a problem in both a practice and a weight room situation. Am I correct? I have nothing to add. That was a genius statement. In fact, it wasn't that long ago where, you know, in my consulting work, somebody called me in and, you know, I heard the whole, my football players are pansies, my football players are soft, blah, 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 you know, come watch the workouts. Well, sure enough, these foot, they were asked to do 45 nonstop minutes of pretty high intensity conditioning work, you know, but hell, I wouldn't do it either, you know. So basically, I just kind of asked the guy, can you like break it down into like 10 minute circuits or something like that and take a few minutes in between and after a little bit of grumbling well now the, all of a sudden the guys have courage all of a sudden they're not pansies anymore but ultimately we forget that it's our job to set up sets and reps and things like that um to in order to allow the athletes to to produce the intensities that you want you know one of the, the things i always say is the intensity you achieve is the level of performance you can expect so if you don't structure the workout so that you can achieve intensity well then what what have you got there, you know? And this is one of the things that I see so, so often in, uh, in you know, in, in collegiate programs, most of them are football programs, but I've seen the same thing in programs and other sports, you know, where these super talented freshman kids come in and, you know, normally it's set up for them to lift like four days a week, okay? So they come in, they lift four days a week. Well, they're not lifting heavy because they're not strong, you know, they're freshmen. So they live four days a week. They live fairly light because that's all they can do at that point in their careers. And they blow up. They have fantastic freshman years because they're finally getting a good, solid lifting program. And typically the momentum kind of continues through their sophomore years. Well, you get to their junior years and suddenly um, now these guys are strong, you know, and when they go in the weight room, they're lifting heavy. And because they're lifting heavy, they need more restoration. They need more rest in between the workouts. So now those four days a week that served them well in the freshman year and the sophomore year suddenly is a disaster in their junior years. And then you start to see things leveling off. And of course, what happens next is injuries. And then it's a, it's a blinging. Well, the kid would have had a great season if it wouldn't have been for the injury. No, no, no. The, the kid was on the way to a bad season and that's, the injury was just a symptom of that. So we, we fail to understand that the higher the level of power output that athlete is capable of producing, the more internal damage they do to their bodies. And as a result of that, what those athletes should be doing is they should be doing workouts that are extremely intense, but spaced out significantly. You know, you take those cats and you move them to like a two day a week lifting program or something like that, where they can really go for it. And suddenly you'll see something really special. But unfortunately, you, we don't see that. And don't get me wrong. I understand football. There's a team culture. Everybody got to do the same thing. True. But you can write a couple of workouts a week for those older athletes, you know, at a little bit of an easier level where they're kind of just repping out and not really going for it so that they have an opportunity to really get heavy or really get fast a couple of times a week instead of just grinding every day. I've always said, look, it's important. I get it. In sports, you have to prove you're tough. I get it. But after you've proven you're tough, you shouldn't have to do it over and over and over and over again. Yeah, I think people get blinded by movies, you know, whatever. The old uh, Bear Bryant, what was it, Junction Boys? Oh, was yes. Mm -hmm. Texas A&M. Was it Junction Boys? Is that what they were? Exactly, yeah. And yeah. Did that team have a good record? I, I, I don't know. We don't you know, remember that point, but... <laughs> And then you get the Navy SEAL stuff and... You know, you know what's funny, Chris, is that I, I'm, I, you know, there was a time in my career where I was doing a ton of ACL rehabs and we were having phenomenal success, phenomenal success. We were getting kids back like 100% in like four and a half months, like five months at the, at the most. I mean, and what we were doing is we were training those kids. We were directing speed power at the injury site every third day. So if a kid trained on Monday, the kid would train again on Thursday. Then the kid would train again on Sunday. Then the kid would train again on Wednesday. Always those two days in between. And we got phenomenal results. And the kid would always, every single one ask, coach, this is going great. Let's train more often. And I'm like, kid, you don't get it. Say so the reason it's going well is because we can go a little harder because we're not trying to train quite so often. And if coach Boo messes up and goes a little too hard, we have two days of eraser. To, to take care of that mistake, you see? 
And, and ultimately that's what we miss is we miss the value of intensity. And that gets back to what you were saying, Tony, is that I understand volume to some extent is important. You know, I, I get that part to, to some extent. You know, vo- you know, there's a certain body of work you have to accomplish. You know, you're not gonna be a great high school athlete training 15 minutes a day. You're not gonna be an Olympian training 45 minutes a day. I, I get that there has to be a body of work, but an increase in volume, particularly short-term accomplishes nothing. An increase in intensity, which is done and accomplished safely, guarantees an increase in performance. So what would you do? We had um, uh, a guy named Mike Whiteman that works for the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. Mm -hmm. Um, He's our first soccer speaker that's ever been at TFC. And he's so unique because, as you know, soccer, nine miles of jogging and walking, um, all aerobic, uh, they never get to max speed. And so the specific training that most trainers did was just more of the same. Mm-hmm. And they added on to the already crazy volumes. But yet Mike has stepped in with this idea that he's going to train maximum outputs. They're going to lift heavy, they're going to sprint fast, jump high, jump far and let the game itself take care of the specific stuff. You reference volleyball, and I actually heard you reference this in a podcast several years ago, and I use it to this day, that there's never max speed sprinting in volleyball, yet you trained a team with max speed. Is that correct? That is correct. And the reason why is like speed training does two things. Um, we, we think of speed training as something that makes you faster, which it, it, of course, does. But ultimately, remember what I said earlier is that you get a level of soreness from it. And that's telling you those tension levels are really high. You're capable of producing uh, more tension in the, those local tissues than you can in the weight room. Plus, the speed training drives neuromuscular uh, integration better. In other words, your ability to activate muscle with the nervous system improves as a result of speed training. So that's why, you know, that we see like volleyball players increase their vertical jumps through speed training. It has nothing to do with running. You know, we, we get caught up in the idea that specificity is what the sport looks like. What specificity really is, is biochemical specificity. You know, what, what specificity really is, is specificity at the tissue level not necessarily in the appearance of the sport. And going back to what we were saying earlier, therein lies one of the dangers of the YouTube workout. You know, yeah, it might look like the sport and therefore there's an inherent uh, attraction to it. You know, it becomes a shiny thing that attracts you. But if you look at the levels of intensity, well, at the tissue level, well, they're just not very high, you know? So the world is full of functional training gurus who are just pissed off because all of the football players got to the NFL and all they ever did was squat, clean, and, and, and bench. And, and, but, but if you look at, look at the beauty of the simplicity, meaning that there's lots of muscle tissue that's involved in those exercises. So you get huge movement on the endocrine needle, and then there's high power output. You know, and you can have high power outputs with really simple exercises. I personally prefer to use the functional training kinds of philosophy in the, 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 the things that I do that are a little sub-maximal, you know, and, and more circuit types of stuff. And then I like to use the simple type of philosophy, you know, power outputs for the most important loading days that I have, whether I'm loading with speed or whether I'm loading with, uh, with uh, weight. You know, it's interesting that you should bring that up, but I work with some uh, NBA teams and um, this is not totally my idea. I shouldn't take credit for it, but the teams that I work with, what they basically do is they will, uh, in between games, they do walkthrough practices and they do individual skill work, you know, working on jump shots or whatever that individual's individual athlete's problems are or whatever. And they play games. That's it. They don't, they don't really practice at hot, fairly high intensities in season. They're doing exactly what you said, allowing the games to actually be the, the, uh, the training, so to speak. And the only athletes who really scrimmage in practice are the ones who don't play much, those who are pretty much on the bench and such. So that philosophy is kind of taking root in, in a lot of ways. You know, when I, uh, a lot of NFL teams now are kind of doing a little, a lot, a really good job of that. You know, my experience with NFL strength coaches is that most of them are phenomenal. 
the, the problem is, is with the collective bargaining, they really don't have a ton of access to the athletes. You know, the athletes spend more time in dealing with their individual personal coaches and those types of things. But I, I, a lot of the NFL guys um, are, are kind of doing really smart stuff as well with their athletes uh, too. So to answer your question, um, that, that's kind of a positive trend in professional sports. Hasn't filtered down to the college level in my, uh, from what I can see yet, but there's always hope. So you've been around, you've been out to all these programs and you've, you've, you know, you've won all kinds of stuff. You've seen all kinds of high level athletes. So I'm asking, what are some common attributes you see among all the athletes, whether it's stuff you see in the weight room on the track or just walking around? What, what, what do they look like to you? Well, what do they look like? Well, that's interesting because in most sports, there's a body type, you know, yeah. and it's very unfortunate, but body types do discriminate, you know, so unfortunately, you know, I wanted to be an NFL too, but it didn't work out, you know, because I wasn't blessed that way. So to make a long story short, you know, they're, they're genetic freaks, you know, and, you know, just by, you know, their genetic ceilings, they're, they're very blessed and they have body types. Now, there are some who overcome body type issues but typically those at some point in time are going to have slower rates of progression or so forth you know like in the track and field world for example you know sprinters are skinny people typically you know you know they're not overly muscled people you know some are a little more muscular than others but you know if you're very very heavily muscled you might succeed at the high school level you may even if you're li really living right succeed in the college level but at the professional level you you kind of hit a ceiling there so that's one thing but the one thing that I want to say is that the thing that makes, there are a lot of athletes who have these body types and have these um, uh, skills, these inherent skills who don't succeed. And I think the thing that is probably the, the biggest attribute that I've seen in the athletes who have been truly successful is that they have a pioneer spirit. And what I mean by a pioneer spirit is that these athletes don't care what they've accomplished. It's always about moving forward for them. They're always willing to risk what they have in order to achieve the next goal. They're always willing to risk everything in order to accomplish the next mission. So they're never worried about, you know, you know I, I listen to sports talk, what's so-and-so's legacy going to be and all that. The good athletes I've been around, they don't care about a legacy. They care about the next game. They don't care about a legacy. They care about the next meet. You know, they care about this season. They, they don't care what, what you think. They just, they're just about winning, winning sake, you know. You know, they, they don't care, you know, the great teams, you know, they, a good team, you know, we don't care that we lost the last two games in a row. We're going to kick your ass this week, you know. Whereas, you know, bad teams are kind of have these, these problems. Sorry, I forgot to put that off. Hope, hope that didn't mess things up. But in any case, that's what I mean when I say like a pioneer spirit, that they're always willing to move forward, you know. And I think, frankly, not to get into, step into touchy subjects, but I think that's why so many great athletes come from backgrounds that are rough backgrounds is simply because you know, they don't have that comfort zone. They understand living outside of a comfort zone and they're, you know, being uncomfortable is something that they're perfectly fine with in many situations, you know. I remember one time I brought in a really talented young lady into my track and field program, you know, and um, I, I remember bringing her in and she was really good and, you know, and we'd been practicing for like two weeks. And she says, coach, I, I really need to practice Saturday. I say, miss practice Saturday? You know, by the way, in, in our culture of our program, if if you have a kid who misses practice, just call 911. Just just do it, okay? Like, because something is seriously wrong. Well, anyway, this kid asked me, you know, can I miss practice Saturday? I said, for what? You know, I'm thinking death in the family or something like that. Well, I was the homecoming queen last year, and I have to give the crown to the next homecoming queen. And then I just realized at that point in time that that athlete – just lowered her ceiling dramatically at that point in time, you know, was afraid, you know, I had been all everything in high school. I had been all everything socially. And, you know, it's going to be really hard for me to move forward because moving forward means I have to be a different person now. And that was just tough for that person. And sure enough, it was tough, you know. It's a great story. Um, I was going to ask you, we had a really cool presentation and, maybe even a better podcast with Alex Natera from mm -hmm. Australia. 
and he talked a lot about isometrics and um, he has found that in, with certain athletes, he can nearly replace the weight room through isometric work. And he, he believes that sprinting itself um, is, is something, and Chris can speak much more eloquently than I can about this, but there's a hell of a lot of co-contraction that goes on in sprinting. Are you in that camp at all? Um, I, I don't want to poo-poo somebody working. I think there's value to it, you know, and I do think that in this coordinated sprinting, that's the definition of it, that there is some co-contraction, so to speak, you know. So I can certainly understand that, that, that viewpoint and such. Uh, when it comes to the isometric world, I don't do them. Uh, I certainly understand the value in, in that regard. And anytime you apply attention to muscle tissue, you're accomplishing something. But I do think that in, uh, when you really go isometric in high dosages, it produces some proprioceptive dysfunction. And what I have seen in some programs that kind of overdo the isometric side of thing, yeah, sure, lifts go up, sure, strength progresses and so forth, but the athlete becomes very uh, non-receptive to skill acquisition in those, in those situations. So ultimately, I've always kind of said that, you know, yeah, you know, if you get the squat up or get the press up or whatever, you know, that doesn't really brand you as a great coach. Ultimately, are you capable of doing these things in ways which still allow athletes to proprioceptively function at a high level? Because if you don't care about skill acquisition, I don't think that that stuff is really that difficult, to be very honest with you. Now, personally, in my coaching, when it comes you know, to absolute strength development and developing those slower forms of strength. You know, I, my talk was, you know, pretty well documented my feelings and how I did it. But ultimately, when we look at that type of strength development, I personally have never really, with the exception of very young athletes, I've never really felt that that type of strength or the lack of that type of strength was the limiting factor, you know. So I, I've seen people in the Olympic Games who can't hardly squat 1.5 times their body weight, you know. So, so ultimately, I value that type of strength to a point, but it seems to never be the limiting factor. So I've never really personally, in my own personal informal research, set off on a mission, so to speak, to find ways to really accelerate the rates of acquisition of that type of strength, simply because I never felt like they were really the limiting factor, to be, to be frank. So... I always felt that what I did was just good enough and wasn't holding me back in that regard. So if you told me that you were taking all of your uh, absolute strength or max strength development and maybe doing it in an isometric format, yeah, I can buy it if you can manage it. But just I would just be on the guy on the on the um, on on caution that uh, the proprioceptive damage is not excessive and that the work is properly timed so that you do get proprioceptive. Um, regeneration. And as I think I talked about in my talk, I use that all the time. You know, I'll kind of mess up proprioceptors on Monday with a squat workout with the idea of them super compensating later in the week. And you can actually do better speed work uh, if you understand the principles of, of proprioceptive super compensation. And if this guy is getting really good results from this, he's, he, he's, that's probably what he's doing, frankly, you know. Uh, I'm betting he's figured that out. Yeah. How do you monitor your athletes through the recovery phases? Like, are you testing what's, what are your go-tos to figure out when someone's ready to go or if they've done too much? Well, I kind of operate on the premise that there are three phases of overtraining. The first phase, you see losses of fine motor control, um, which means that technique goes off a little bit. Sprint mechanics are off a little bit, shooting slumps, hitting slumps, you know, those types of things, you know, um, all mistakes reappear, that type of thing. The second phase of, um, of overtraining, I feel, is a loss of elasticity and mobility. And the third phase is a power drop off. Uh, so what I do is when I get to kind of critical times in season, uh, I will typically administer on the same day a standing long jump test and a standing triple jump test keeping in mind that the standing long jump is pretty much a power test, the standing triple jump is pretty much a uh, reactive strength or an elasticity test. So therefore, if both of these tests are really good, no problem. On the other hand, if I see a standing long jump that's really good, but a standing triple jump that's poor, well, that tells me that power-wise, we're still fine, but elasticity-wise, we're 
compromised. And that's telling me that this is an athlete who isn't recovered yet at this particular point. So by identifying the differences in the rates at which these different qualities degrade in overtraining situations and kind of matching them to certain types of tests that I do, that's kind of how I figure this stuff and I kind of know where to go from there according to that. In fact, with the professional group today, uh, I, I did that exact thing. You know, we, we just finished up a big, tough cycle, uh, had one day off. Now we're back. We tested, did a standing long jump, did a standing triple jump test. Out of six people, five of them killed both tests. One kid standing long jump was perfect. Standing triple jump was off. That's the kid I know that's not recovering. Interestingly, that kid's 30. The other's in their late 20s. Surprise, surprise, you know, so... So that's kind of what I do. That's kind of a go-to for me. And it's quick and dirty and easy. Now, as far as phase one of overtraining with the uh, discoordination, there they ain't no technology. The only technology that has ever been created to determine that is a brain and two eyeballs. You speak uh, more than any coach that, that I'm around about hormonal response. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember you've talked about this a lot um, throughout the years, and I'm always listening to your podcast, and you're always mentioning hormonal, hormonal response. Do you test, or is this something that you just know through science, or um, how do you know if somebody's getting a hormonal response? Trust me, I, uh, they're recovering. You know, if they can recover to typical rates of work, then I know that I have what I need there. I call it endocrine fitness just to kind of give it a catch-all term. But trust me, Tony, I am no endocrinologist by any means. But I do know that with most men, you know, intensity drives uh, serum testosterone. You know, I know with, uh, that volumes of strength training, as long as power output levels stay high, drive um, um uh, growth hormone responses. I know that lactate drives growth hormone responses. So I just make sure that those things are always there, you know, and, and then you, you monitor your testing. And if the athletes are recovering right, well, that's kind of telling you that endocrine wise, you're fine, you know, so it don't take a PhD in endocrinology by any means. It just means that there are certain bases that you got to continually hit. And I, and I think the one that we kind of lose sight of is lactate, you know, I remember when I was a young coach, first getting started, and I'm reading all the training theory books, you know, Schmelinski and, uh, you know, um, Hare and all of these kind of texts, you know, and they kind of talked about intensities and how you progress your intensities over time. And then once you get to the point where you have really high intensities, all you do is high intensity work. And I just repeatedly failed because my athletes could do a great high intensity workout. And then I tried to do another high intensity workout a few days later, and it just was a downward spiral. And I realized that I had to start doing something in between. Now, another thing these training theory books said was do all this circuit stuff in general prep, you know, and I would do all that circuit stuff in general prep. And then I'd pull it out in specific prep, like the book said, and then I noticed the athletes, something didn't happen there. Well, then I figured it all out. Uh, you know, ultimately, I just decided to go on my own. And I realized that a lot of those texts had a drug bias in them. And a lot of the endocrine support was coming from a, a syringe, you know, uh, in, in those coaching philosophies. So what I started doing was keeping my circuits going because I just thought the athletes looked better when we kept the circuits going. And I started kind of a, a, a philosophy of vacillating between really high intensity work and lower intensity work at those critical times of the year, you know, kind of yo-yoing up and down where we hit our high intensity day, then we'd come back down just to kind of maintain stimulation for a little while. And then we would recover and then we'd go for it again. And I learned that I could do those workouts. I just couldn't do them as often as the drug beast could do them, you know, so I, I think to this day that drugs have really wrecked a lot of good coaching, you know, because, you know, as coaches, you want to believe what in what your predecessors did. You want to look at these texts and take from them and so forth. And unfortunately, you know, that bias is still kind of out there. And, you know, there are a lot of coaches that are still trying to do stuff that was done with drugs that, you know, and, and they're struggling with it. And I just want to take them and I just want to take them and hug them and say, trust yourself. Now, that hormonal response, is, is that a response that is specific to the weight room? No, no, it's, it's program wide, you know. I mean, like can, lactate, can I yeah. get a hormonal response through sprint training? 
Absolutely, unquestionably. And the intensity is what's valuable in that response. You know, uh, we know that intensity of training in any form pretty much drives that type of stuff in men. Now, women are a little different. You know, women typically are a little bit more volume based in their responses. And again, that's an overgeneralization. But suffice it to say, intensity does drive those types of things, particularly the uh, testosterone response. Like I said, and, and growth hormone, the, the big thing is seems to be lactate, number one, because, you know, I knew I knew 35 years ago that when I did circuits, my athletes looked better. But it's only now that we're starting in research is kind of showing a, a link between lactate responses and growth hormone production. And we still don't know the exact biochemical link, but we can see that there's something there. Good coaches have known that for a long time, but the research is catching up. So the lactate and the other thing is the volume of strength training. You know, when I was um, working at, when I, when I came to LSU, I got a chance to bring really talented kids into the program there. And I would start them on, you know, pretty good weight training programs, keeping in mind that we didn't have a strength and conditioning coach back then. I did all the, we all did our own strength training, basically. So I did all of the strength training in my event group with all the athletes I worked with. And we did weight circuits and we did good weight training. And I actually had a couple of athletes who, showed growth spurts in their freshman years and which was very interesting you know and Dan had kind of sat down with me and showed me some research and he kind of came up with what he called bodybuilding routines and so forth which are not competitive bodybuilding routines they're basically weight circuits that are endocrine stimulants well to make a long story short uh, I don't think that um, these, I think that these athletes were probably genetically programmed to attain these height increases, you know, to, to be that tall, but they weren't getting three square meals a day and, you know, and they weren't in good programs. And I think what I did is I helped them fulfill their genetic potential growth wise, but it was just interesting to see. And, you know, to be able to take these, uh, th these endocrine systems and develop them through proper strength training, uh, it, it excites me because what you've done is you've basically raised their ceilings as far as performance and work capacity are concerned. And the nice thing about it is it's all internally produced. So you're probably doing them some good as far as long-term health is concerned as well, you know? It's almost like um, the hormonal response is, is a substitute for illegal steroids. Well, yes, in, in a lot of ways from the performance standpoint, but keeping in mind that uh, illegal drugs are an externally introduced stimulus that the body has to juggle and deal with, so therefore it causes problems. Whereas these responses due to exercises are internally produced, therefore the body has no uh, problem at all uh, responding in an effective way. Like I said, you know, you would develop muscle, you would develop nervous system, you would develop everything, every other system. Why would you not look at endocrine development as a as a goal and I just think that that's probably what you know Dan was on to and what I'm kind of on to right now and as a result we're capable of attaining some pretty good training intensities because the athletes uh, recovery uh, capabilities are enhanced because of this you know what's interesting is that um, all the research kind of teams tends to lean toward the fact that your growth hormone uh, responses are pretty plastic and you know really you can really change them dramatically in a positive direction up until the age of about 25 or, or so, you know? And so that's the, most of us are working with athletes that are younger than that. So that represents a huge window. You know, anybody, you know, when you work around high school kids, you know, the hormones are raging, you know, which means that they're fit to be trained at that particular age. And it's also the reason why, you know, when I see an athlete who's older, you know, like, 27, 28 years old, and suddenly they have come up with kind of a magic performance boost that my little red light kind of goes on, you know. That doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger Clemens was what, 36 and washed up. And, and then the red light came on. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens a lot in that sport, but or in a lot of sports, to be honest with you, you know, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying never. Sometimes people change coaches or, you know, and there's some sports where brain power really matters too, you know, where you start to really figure things out and such, you know, you know, if, if you're an NFL quarterback and you suddenly start to improve a little bit, you know, at that age, because now all of a sudden you, the game slows down for you and you start to understand, you know, the tactical side of things is important. 
but you know, but if you're like a defensive lineman and you basically are employed to use your body as a as a, a battering ram every play, and then suddenly there's a huge increase. Well, uh, well, we'll see. Boo, how how many? Well, I, I'll preface it with this. I'm fascinated with Charles Darwin for a number of reasons. I'm an old science teacher and everything. But one of the things that I love about Darwin is that we know of like 15,000 letters he wrote to over 2,000 people uh, in his, and they weren't like, hey, how are you type of letters. They were exchanging science. Mm -hmm. And how much of your day is spent answering emails? Quite a bit. I, I typically get depending on the time of the year, I'll typically get anywhere between 150 to 300 a week. And I try to answer every single one. Now, the only thing that saves me is that I get the same question lots of times, you know, so you kind of know where to go immediately or that type of stuff. Or, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you can kind of send a person to the answer rather than getting the answer yourself or whatever. So, but no, it's quite a bit. And I, but I take it very seriously because like I said, I had people who were willing to do that for me when I was young, you know, I'll never forget, man. When, you know, I, I bothered the hell out of Dan when I was a younger coach, you know, and I was always calling him and asking him and things like that. And it was about two, three years later where I started to get my own little following of mentorees and so forth. And then I said, oh, my God, is this what I'm doing to Dan? I can't call him anymore. <laughs> well, I have your phone number now. So, so I'll, just, I'll send you text messages. But anyway, but email is awesome because, you know, if you're busy, you just you just wait a few days, you know, and if you're not busy, you know, but personally, I get a lot out of it, too, because some of my very best pr friends have come from relationships that began that way. And a lot of these people send things back, you know, a lot of times it becomes a two way type of thing. And it's helped me in a lot of ways. So it, it's been a tremendous positive in my life. The fact that I've been able to be a mentor to a lot of coaches and the fact that I've been able to develop a lot of personal relationships as a result of that. So, so in, in no way do I see that as a negative. It's been a real positive. And I'll be frank with you. I think a lot of the ideas that I've come up with and a lot of the things that have kind of spurred me on to better things have come because these questions have challenged me. Well, I think I don't get nearly as many as you. You know, I, I probably spend an hour a day answering emails. But I have found that I've become much better at answering that same question, that my words have gotten better and, and I'm, I'm able to get to the point better. It's just like anything else. The more you do it, you will get more proficient at it. Yeah. You know, I, I remember uh, the whole idea of just, I, I always, the young coaches, you know, always are kind of like, um, uh, what's the drill, you know? <laughs> and uh, they want to know how to do the drill. And I said, well, first of all, your body ain't going to allow you to always do that drill. But ultimately, I always challenge them, you know, just stay away from demonstrations and learn to use your verbal skills because they'll be with you all your life. Whereas, you know, demonstrations won't be with you all your life. And it, you know, and I, I just try to challenge these young coaches to diversify their coaching methods, you know, because, it, you know, just showing them how to do it is, you know, doesn't work all the time. And even if you can do the drill perfectly, it doesn't guarantee anything, you know. I, I've never been a huge fan of the learn by doing clinic, to be honest with you. If you ask me to do one, I'll do it. But I've never been a huge fan of it because I always hear the thing, you know, well, if I, if I know how it feels, I'll be able to teach it. No, you know. So if I go out there and do a bunch of uh, long jump drills, do you really think it feels the same way to me that it felt to Carl Lewis or like, you know, you really think it felt the same to me like it felt like, no, it's not, you know. So ultimately it's about coaching, it's about using verbal skills and whatever communication skills you have available to you to get these ideas across and such. And mentoring is no different. It's just about communication as you've discovered, you know, and you just become better at communication for communication's sake. And I'm sure you found like I have that I do a better job of communicating to the athletes out on the field or on the track or wherever I am because of the fact that I answer these questions every day. Because every once in a while, one of them will give you the same question, you know. You know, I agree with the learn by doing. I've never gotten anything out of that. But maybe the most forgotten or underapplied concept in learning how to coach is to hang out with the coach. 
Oh, I, no question about it. I visited Chris Corfus in 2008 at seven in the morning, watching him coach his team. And mm -hmm. it was one of the most inspiring. And, and I just gained so much. And I'd already been coaching for 30 some years. But I think the older you are, the more you appreciate that. I know that uh, Latif Thomas said that, um, that he uh, shadowed you for a few days. And it was like life changing. You would agree that, that that hanging around with a coach and watching him work with kids might be one of the best things you can do. Well, it's what I did. It's what it's what Dan let me do. And you know what was one of the the, uh, the things that um, that Latif said was that not only did he learn a lot about coaching from following me, but he also learned that I have problems too. You know, he, he found out that the world is not perfect over there. You know, you go around thinking that, oh, they do everything perfect. And you find out, no, it's, it's not perfect either there, you know. So that's important. But there, you're, no question about it. But this is one thing I want to share with you, too, is that the fact that you're coaching while you do it is a big deal. You know, I get, I get people who call me all the time. I want to come volunteer at LSU, you know. Okay, come volunteer at LSU, great. You know, you'll get to, you know, you know, you'll get to keep the time on the circuits and do a few things or whatever. But why don't you just like get mentored by an LSU coach and continue to coach where you are? That way you still get the mentorship experience. You still, but then you still have athletes to work with. You know, the thing that I think was very helpful to me was that not was that I followed Dan around, you know, and, and watched what he was doing and so forth. But I was also coaching my own athletes at the time. And, you know, I mean, you, you know, situations where people are around book knowledge all the time and never actually get to do anything and they end up being kind of pervert, professionally perverted. Well, this is what I this is what I mean is ultimately if you're coaching while you're learning this stuff, then the experience becomes far more valuable than if you keep, keep it in a book or keep it in a diary thinking I'm going to use it later. Chris, you got it. Are there any questions and answers? Q and A going on? Doesn't look like it. No. Everyone's been really quiet tonight. They have been. <laughs> I, I, I got a text from Rob Assisi saying that uh, that it's going to be hard to come up with a two minute and twenty second clip from this because there's been so many quotable things, and I totally agree. Boo, you've been a great guest, and I'm just absolutely honored to spend this last hour with you. And, uh, and thank you so much for agreeing to, for TFC and your presentation. Well, I've been kind of following your uh, program from afar for a while. And when I was asked to take part, I was truly flattered. And I, I, I just want to say before I leave that I, I just appreciate what you guys do. You know, ultimately, you know, what coaches do every day with their athletes, you know, just teaching them to win with grace and lose with dignity and those types of things, taking athletes and, you know, making them feel you know, making them understand uh, what's possible. You know, sometimes, you know, coaches are the only people left who are, you know, teaching athletes that the, the problem with you is you sometimes, you know, they're the only people left who are, you know, teaching athletes that how hard you try really matters. I mean, coaches are performing a really valuable role in society. And I hate to think where our society would be without coaches. And anytime that somebody like you two guys have done make a genuine effort to helping coaches in that mission, that's special to me. So I, I appreciate what you guys are doing for the coaching profession uh, because it's the greatest profession in the world. Amen. There's your quote, Tony. There you go. <laughs> I got my clip. All right. Thanks. Thanks.